So, Jack, welcome to the Judgment Call podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you, Thorsten, and uh, I look forward to our chat. Yeah, uh, I think it's going to be very interesting. You have a very colored history. You spent 32 years um, in the CIA, and uh, for some time you've been acting director and associate director of the CIA. And uh, you also wrote books about uh, your experience. First, um, The Good Hunting Book, and later what we're going to talk about today is Spy Master's Prism. I was curious, when you look at that time uh, when you were at the CIA, what's kind of the, the most vivid memory you still have from that time? That's a really uh, great question. I remember the day I left the agency. It's very hard to literally walk out the door. It's not like most companies. You can't go back and have lunch. You, know, you, yeah. you call, your phone's not answered, right? So it's traumatic. I'm surprised I, you let you. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I'm saying you can't go back. So it's very emotional. And I actually during my career escorted two people to the door because someone would come and say Joe's last day and he won't leave his desk, you know, or Sally and you go down and you walk them out because it is an emotional break. And it's, uh, I don't know anything that quite stacks up to the separation. Now, because of the level of the jobs I had, I, I had more access going back and forth, but by and large, it was, uh, and when I left, I wasn't sure what relationship, if any, I'd have with it. But the last day, you wa I walked around the atrium, and uh, again, if we were doing an architectural discussion, I would talk of the beauty of the agency and how the founding fathers designed it. But there's an atrium, and on the one side, there are the pictures of the various directors. So on my own walking out the door, you know, I walked by all the directors' pictures, right? Thought back of the good and bad. Uh, all had merits. And then there's another wall where they have professionally um, commissioned paintings of key events in the agency. And one of them was the famous spy during World War II, Virginia Hall, who jumped behind the lines to organize the French resistance with their prosthetic leg over her shoulder. But halfway down the hall is also a picture of the stinger shoot down of a Russian helicopter in the struggle with the Russians in Afghanistan. And I was part of that CIA effort in fact, I was in charge of that task force. So when I uh, when I walked by that, that came back as a, a vivid a, a vivid memory. And you always remember your first tour. And, and I was in Chile when Allende was overthrown in a coup, and it's really had a great impact on how I viewed covert action. And then as you come down and, and around the atrium, um, you know, you you start to think of some of the spies that have uh, that. You know, we had on both sides, and you know, I thought about Rick Ames, who was a spy inside the CIA, who I knew uh, quite well, and actually worked for me at that point in time. And then you get down to the first level on the right. You have actually, if you're looking out the door on your left, are the stars of all the people that are died in the duty and are etched in the wall. And you stop and think about some of them that I knew well that were either blown up or assassinated over over the course of my 32 years. The other side is a quote from the New Testament that says, thou shalt know the truth and it'll set you free. And that is just give us the facts, tell us what's going on in the world and we, the policymakers, will act on it. And, you know, when you think about and ponder your career, you think of what the mission was. You think of the people you've known and lost, the high points that I just described, the leadership. And then to the unknowing eye, when you walk out to the door, there's a statue to Nathan Hale. And Nathan Hale was the first spy uh, that was hung by the Brits during the American Revolution. And, you know, I but one life to give to my country. So it reminds you of... Uh, the vividness of the business. So when you talk about what are those memories, um, you know, on your last day, you sort of accumulate them. Over the years, you also reflect back when you write books about your training and all the things you did in the CIA and the people you've met. But I think the hi highlights are those that I just sort of walked you around. I gave you a tour of the inside of the CIA. Yeah, I mean, the CIA has this very mysterious um, 
and at certain times very changing um, brand to it, right? So we, we think of it, and when we think of movies, it's this wonderful game of spies um, that's constantly shifting. And uh, one thing that when we talk about shifting is your experience in Afghanistan when you were at the helm when the the Mujahideen, the, the local um, Islamic forces were fighting the Russians. We supported them, we gave them aircraft, um, anti-aircraft weapons. And then later on, when we were in Afghanistan, or when Al-Qaeda became um, known, they used those anti-aircraft weapons against us. And it seems like there is there's so many so many variables in this game, right? There's people on the other side, there's geopolitics, there's strategy, but things can shift on the, cr- on the ground really quickly within a couple of years. Um, what, what, what was your learning out of this time from Afghanistan? Well, my first point would be almost any endeavor in life, it's worth reading a lot of history. So when you're going to CIA, you ought to know the history of, of the institution and you need to know the history of America and the role of intelligence in it. And this is true if you're in foreign policy or anything else. So, you know, you don't want to go from pillar to post and just march along. And I spent a lot of time, and that's why I write books, looking at, you know, the intelligence business and the factors that make for good intelligence, good covert action and, and, and bad covert action. So when you talk about the CIA's effort to drive Afghanistan out, there's a couple of things that the audience that needs to be uh, mindful of. And that is when when the Russians invaded, there was a world uh, rejection of that action, uh, tremendous pressure in the United States to try and push back. Um, And if you're going to push back, then you have to go to the people that are going to do the pushing back. And that was the Mujahideen. I mean, you can't force feed and people are relearning that lesson. You can't force feed democracy. You can't force feed political reaction. So you have to go with what you have. And what we had was a group of people on the ground that truly did not want the Russians in their country. They didn't want the Brits in. They've never wanted anybody. Yet. So we were able to mobilize that. But there's a big difference between the Mujahideen and, and the Taliban. The Taliban did not exist all right. And Al-Qaeda is really a, a, a product from the Sudan, uh, not the Sudan, from Saudi Arabia, but bin Laden was living in the Sudan and then eventually went to Afghanistan. In other words, it wasn't, he wasn't a homegrown product. So when the Russians left, uh, nature took its course and the, Afri- uh, the uh, uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan, Afghanistanis decided, Afghans decided, that uh, they, uh, they were going to create their own destiny and hence came in the Taliban. That is not a national security risk for the United States, whether or not the Taliban controls the, the Putin tribes or the, in other words, that was not a national security issue. It was only in the big struggle. The problem came when bin Laden, who was living there, ran his attack. So the CIA went, back in, special forces went along, mobilized the tribes that were used to to push the Taliban out. I mean, that's that's something people don't realize. So my hope would have been we would have kept the covert action program going instead of going in in a full U.S. presence. We should have gone in, got got bin Laden, and did what we could to help those that were in our lined up with our national interest, but let it go. So bin Laden uh, was the cause of our entry, but uh, you know he eventually met his demise, demise, demise there. To the best of my knowledge, there has been no Stinger missile used against uh, U.S. aircraft. I, I don't know that, that that ever happened. So uh, I think it's a different, different type of struggle. So the people fighting... The Taliban is not the same. Some of them may be of the Mujahideen, but they ha- people have to understand that the Taliban was a product long after America left and decided we were not going to, there was no more national interest in that uh, country. Now, yeah. it's long, a long answer because it's a historic answer. So I'll try and keep it tighter. But there are, I did want to lay it out so that there's a full, this, you know, it can't be a soundbite of a two-second answer because it has, 
you know, a lot of history in it, and there's a lot of misunderstandings which you've allowed me to articulate. Yeah, I'm glad we're doing this. So I, I don't know enough from that time period at all. What what I know is from from the movie, right? From Charlie Wilson's War. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> not. What I, that's what not. I read. <laughs> you, you know how these things work. I mean, there is only a limited amount of things you can pay attention to, which is information overload. And movies, for for whatever reason, we give it two hours. And whatever story is portrayed, it's often BS. But we give it two hours, and we think we know, but obviously we don't, right? No, but I think you touch on it. You touched on it earlier. And touched again, and that's the role of movies. And I, I used to be as a young intelligence officer operative, incensed with the uh, with the portrayal of James Bond. You know, never had to write a report. Never had to do an accounting. Never had to go home to his wife. Never had to go to the grocery store. Right? Wait, he, James Bond is he, married. Is he <laughs> so, all the things that real spies end up in. And, you know, uh, and of course, he never, never held accountable for anything. So when you look at the, the real life, it, there was a gap. But then I began to think, wait a minute, if the world thinks that you look at the way you do, <laughs> that you, you are somehow a James Bond figure who's omnipotent, that is a great marketing device for getting people to come work with you. So I, I, I eased up on it. But on Charlie Wilson's War, I didn't ease up very much. I knew Charlie very well. Yeah. Uh, a lot of good things to say about Charlie he was a real patriot and so on, but it wasn't his war. And I think I mentioned you but at one point we had dinner in Spark Steakhouse, which is a steakhouse in New York, where the head of the mafia, Castilla, Paul Castellano, was murdered at the front step. So to Charlie, that was romance and a really cool place to go. But over dinner, he, you know, we had our wives and he reached across, and put his hand on my arm and said, Jack, I know you didn't like the book. You're gonna hate the movie. <laughs> then he knew yeah. what I meant. What he knew what it, it really was a war, a U.S. government war, run with you know hundred people all doing their own own thing. I mean, own mission, making saddles, taking mules, buying weapons, a lot of logistics. It doesn't make for a great movie. I'm not time Tom Hanks, and there is no Julie Roberts. There is a Charlie Wilson, I'm sure, somewhere out there. And I think it. The problem with it is. People shouldn't look at action as, you know, something that is done on the fly. You know, it's just it's spontaneous. It has to be planned, organized. You have to have people on the ground. There's conditions, which I go into both books. I talk about it in Good Hunting and the newer ones by Master's Prison. What makes for this type of covert action to be successful? And that was why the, the Charlie Wilson's War, why it was fun, it makes it look like a, a congressman and a you know and a, a socialite from Texas can change the world, and that that isn't the way, and that isn't the history of covert action, uh, based on my own experience and plus all my studies about it. It is a lot of tools that um, we associate with the CIA. Maybe you can tell us a little more how they actually fit in. So one is obviously information gathering and is getting intelligence from foreign sources. The second part is to act on it, and I think there's a lot of of subconscious methods and that one would be to make movies right to make movies that show the world but it portray a picture that maybe actually not be true this propaganda obviously that seems to be um, an undervalued tool at least in that direction then there seems to be covert options when we have like navy seals going on and operations when they when they go into um, a specific country well, well, how big is that tool so that the cia can select from so when the agency was remember First of all, America does not come comfortably to intelligence and secrets. It's not openness, America. So George Washington had great uh, intelligence service. There's a show called Turn, which talks about it. It's actually quite fun, even though it's Hollywood. Lincoln had one. Franklin Roosevelt had one. But what happens every time that there's a crisis, there's an intelligence group, and then it's dissolved. And after World War II, they dissolved the intelligence community. There was a small remnant of it. And the founding, the forerunner, the OSS, Office of uh, uh, Strategic Services, uh, was disbanded. So it wasn't until 1947 uh, that it was organized. But one has to go back and look at its organization when it was created in 1947. And it says, you have to get out there and collect information, make sure you're providing early warning that we don't have another Pearl Harbor. That's your mission. And then there's a sentence in there that says, and carry out those special activities 
as directed by the President of the United States. That's the only writ. That's the only sort of underpinning of the action part. So when you look at the CIA, its main mission, at least in it, was to collect information, analyze the information, disseminate the information, and give your best strategic and tactical information. But once the Cold War got started, people began to realize we either put troops on the ground or we use covert action. So that began to take on a bigger and bigger role. And as a consequence, most of the things that the agency associates with, is associated with the agency is the action part. And the spying part is fairly, I don't know if this isn't the right word, benign in the American consciousness. In other words, they expect spying and so on. It's the covert action where you get into the political, um, political debates and so on. So in the simplistic terms, you know, James Bond is your covert action guy. You know, he's not writing reports. He's not really meeting agents very much. He's usually booming and banging. And then Nut Corey in his books, this guy who came in from the that's your espionage, the betrayal, recruiting, what makes for agents. And the agency has always had those two elements in it. And I believe both of them are terribly important. And it's, the, it's a hybrid uh, task. And I, I think the agency provides great service to the president when he needs something done that has to be done um, uh, discreetly and without uh, uh, public knowledge. It is brief, by the way. I should note that it's important to say those things as approved by the president of the United States. All covert action operations, this is the one thing that most listeners really don't understand. It's the biggest thing that I encounter. And that is the CIA is not a rogue elephant out there doing its own thing. I know of no covert action in its history, public. More importantly, privately, I don't know of any covert action operation. that wasn't personally approved by the president of the United States and wasn't and from about 75 forward in writing. So when you see something and you see the CIA being slammed for some action, everyone needs to understand that they are executing policy by the president of the United States. And the President of the United States is held accountable to, by Congress and by the people, and that's the way it should be. So when we're troubled by covert action, we need to put the responsibility where it belongs, in the executive branch and to a lesser degree, congressional oversight. I did not know that. That's 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 definitely a fascinating fact, and that, that changes the whole image of the CIA. I think it's, I, don't, I have no idea why it is not more often talked about. When you think about the CIA, and you, you mentioned that earlier, how dangerous is it for most of the the, the people who work in the CIA? Um, and obviously, we understand there's a lot of office jobs, desk jobs. They're probably less dangerous. They're as dangerous as any other office job. But is it really something where, where whenever you worked for the CIA, you felt there is a threat to your personal safety or to your family at some point? Is that something you're really aware of? Well, let me come back to those stars again. I mean, of all the stars, half of them were probably there when I arrived. But of those stars, uh, half a dozen people I knew, personally knew, were uh, either assassinated, killed in action, uh, or uh, the, the subject of a terrorist attack. So statistically, if you think about your life, to have six people that have been subjected to this sort of uh, risk is... Um, is noteworthy to say say the least. Most people go through life and don't know anyone that's been assassinated or hit by a terrorist attack or blown up in a building or you know. So, and I knew it's at least half a dozen, and there's some that uh, you know that are their seals, their their identities are still uh, concealed. Every day, uh, I would think when you have a war zone uh, in the Iraq Afghanistan struggles, you know, you you're, you're going to lose more people because they're in the ground. IEDs, uh, so you're going to find a more uh, um, loss of Amer uh, intelligence officers because they're in close. They're usually working in places uh, many times where no U.S. presence is there, and where it is, they're in the front of, of the, uh, the, the the struggle. So I think they're highly risky. When you're talking about spying in Berlin or Mexico City or London, the, the risk uh, dropped down quite a bit. Here you're talking about, there's sort of understandings. What, and I refer to them in, in the, 
in Spy Master's Prism is Moscow rules. There's one set that a lot of CIA people talk about that are really fairly modern, which is how do you operate inside Moscow? How do you put down a dead drop? How do you put the skies on? And that's tactical, right? But there's an older set that the founding fathers, and I came in behind some of those that were in World War II, there was an understanding with the Russians that certain things wouldn't happen. And one of those was not interfering in each other's country. You could fight all around the world, but Russians were not to be doing political action in the United States, and we shouldn't be doing it in, in Russia. Very few exceptions to that over the long, long history. Don't counterfeit each other's money, why we would destroy the economy of both countries in the world. So there were understandings. One of them was uh, we weren't going to uh, assassinate or rough up each other's officers. Now, there's a few exceptions on the roughing up, very few. But by and large, you know, the, the threat from the adversary was there was an understanding. But every country you're in, and particularly in the day of terrorism, Every one of our officers in any city in the world has to be, I mean, I've known a couple. I know a couple personally who've been kidnapped and tortured and killed. I mean, that's a terrible record considering that we're a relatively small organization. So the risks are real and the risk to your family because I've, I've been in countries where there have been explosions and next to my house and whether my house was going to be overrun and you have your families with you. And these, these are indeed... Uh, high-risk uh, situations. One of the things I've learned is if it gets that bad, get your family out, even if you pay for it yourself, right? But when you're young, and, and I think of this in my early career, you know, there's that invincible, and it's a, it's a real vulnerability. The invincibility, somehow nothing bad is going to happen. We know in life that's yeah. not true, but when, when you're in it, and I, that's one last comment, it's like the boiling frog. You know, you, you have a pot boiling and throw a frog in at first he thinks it's nice and warm and a little bit warmer next thing you know he's he's being cooked you know so a lot of people in very tense situations don't realize how intense it is because they're they're going through the process in such small increments that no single second or moment reaches a threshold and then all of a sudden you wake up and you find it you know there are people shooting at you yeah that, I can imagine that's terrifying. And when when you make a rational risk assessment of spy work, I almost never come out on that side and say, "Okay, that's worth it." Right? You, you need to have some something, and I don't want to say something is wrong with that, but you need to have an an, an amazing motivation to take that risk on. For usually relatively paltry pay, this definitely you, you you advance the patriotism. But I think it's an amazing sacrifice that you do to your country, and it's 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 not rational from my point of view, or maybe it is. Well, uh, what I do is I, I often interview people that are interested because they know I've written books, so you know they want to join the CIA. And the very first thing I look at and talk to them is a sense of mission. In other words, if you do not have a sense that you really, you know, if you want to see the world and do, uh, you know, cool things, great, but that's not, you're not going to stay in the agency, you're not going to be fulfilled, and you're not going to be very good. You really have to go in with a sense of mission. During World War II, there was no trouble getting lines of people to join the special forces, jumping behind the lines, putting their, less, uh, their, their lives at risk, um, much like a soldier, the, the similarities. You really have to believe in, in the mission. And, you know, you have periods when the world is fairly tranquil and people tend less application, the people that come in are a little more mellow. And then you have 9-11, and there were people 55 years old coming to me saying, listen, I think I should join the, uh, the CIA. I'm a, I'm a, a cardiologist. <laughs> I'm a top doctor at NYU, NYU. And, but I want to serve my country. There's a lot of, thank God, a number of people out there that really believe. And it is a distinguishing characteristic. And they spot this in the interviews. I mean, they spent, they might, God, they must have interviewed a million people over the years that, you know, that I was there. And they've tested and retested, and it's it, it, it's hard to project the false sense of mission. So, yeah. you know, if you don't have it, you're really going to melt when the going gets tough. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, I want to talk about Russia and uh, your view of the current Russia. And you said that just earlier, there used to be an understanding that 
we shouldn't interfere in each other's country. That's obviously changed. We know that Russia is uh, launching cyber attacks against us and has been doing this for quite some time. I'm actually surprised that the US hasn't done that um, to Russia, or maybe we have. Um, well, what is so unique about the last couple of years? Why is, is Russia such an underrated enemy, so to speak? Well, that's the thesis of my book, right? Which is everybody wants to talk about China. We should. It's going to be, and it is, the major geopolitical, military, long-term, big power struggle competitor, yeah. right? Russia's economy, you know, is like uh, Spain or Italy's, you know, it's, it's not a competitor in the world. Right. It has nuclear weapons, so you can't ignore it. And it's punching well above its weight. But when you look at it from an intelligence point of view, who is most aggressive, particularly inside the United States, it's the Russians hands down. And what I'm trying to do is bring attention back to that problem. And where that surfaced for me was in 2016, when it wasn't that the Russians hacked into our political uh, parties, because governments around the world hack into all types of things. The problem was they used it. They actually started using information, agitating in the political process, interfering in the electoral process. I don't think it was decisive, but it certainly wasn't insignificant. I mean, I think there were a couple thousand tweet sites. Facebook had, you know, 400 sites, 2,000 events, I think it reached 29 million people. They used Troll Factory. So they were in there, but their message wasn't great, but they were trying to destabilize, not destabilize, let me correct that, weaken the political process. They don't want destabilization because they don't want a, some wild card in the White House that they can't uh, you know, manage the national security relationship. But part of their strategy is to keep their main competitors and adversaries sort of weak. So we spent a lot of time, you know, impeachments and collusion. But the real story is what were the Russians doing in the bigger strategic point of view? And that really isn't so much about the, the, the political figures. It's about how do you weaken the political process? And it's a part of what they call the hybrid strategy. And, and I'll, 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 I'll get I'll get I'll get to that. So the interesting thing here, going back to your earlier point, Dorson, is we had rules that we weren't going to do that. That that, bro that was broken. Walked away from it. And no one seems to be addressing or knowing how to address it because the cyber world is so new, new in the last 30 years. In other words, the ability to go into a country and cause political action at a standoff distance is a capability that is immense. And we have no understanding on what we will not do. So it's clear. That's why Russian and, uh, and sanctions have been imposed on Russia, not just by the United States, but by Europe, is because they are using cyber. So your question is a really good one. And that is the one about what's the response, right? The problem is, this is a very dangerous path and a very dangerous, and, and this is where Putin, I think, is overplaying his hand and it'll probably blow back. And that is, you know, once you're meddling in our internal affairs, you know, it doesn't do any good to fire a tomahawk across the desert. You have to respond in kind. Sanctions are important and useful. It's not responding in kind. You're saying, why don't you respond in kind? The problem is, I think we are a restrained country. People may not believe this around the world, but U.S. power is so much greater than it's utilized. And, uh, and I'm glad of that. But we're restrained because people understand that once you start down that road, they're going to respond, we'll respond with more, they'll respond, and we will have a back and forth in the cyber war with no understanding, no rules. And unlike a battlefield on the, in the military kinetic sets, you won't be able to see it. But I think the recent sanctions, if just one more thing on this, the recent sanctions, the President Biden said, we're going to put sanctions, we're going to expel people, we're going to uh, uh, go after some of the sovereign wealth, but then there will be unseen. And the question there is, are we talking about responding with cyber activities inside Russia that is similar? 
And my hope would be we really need to have a sit down with them. We need to be negotiating from a position of strength for sure. There has to be some understanding, sub rosa where you can't see it. People are not going to come to a meeting to discuss cyber publicly, what you can't do, because then it means you have to admit things that no one's prepared, prepared to admit. So, I mean, I'm sure we're trying to do that, but it takes two parties, two, two, two sides. Both the Russians and the Americans have to agree that this is desirable. And I haven't seen so far a reaction from the Russians that they're interested in ameliorating uh, this problem. Now, hopefully they will. Maybe the sanctions will get them there. But I think this is an under underestimated problem. It's not that they have the capability to attack uh, most people that track this type of activity, understand that. It's really the fact that there's no control over it right now. And it can only get worse without an understanding. And Yeah, yeah I think the, the cyber capabilities of Russia are, are, are given... You know, I've worked in the tech industry for for the longest time, and if you think of hacking, you always go to Russia. When I thought of people who had to do advanced math for me, um, I went to Novosibirsk and I recruited them. So they they are plentiful and they are affordable. Um, their, their salaries are not crazy high, and the super skilled people seem to be all in that industry. Seem to be in Russia, so they definitely have the talent, and I think they have. The, the, the way to hack U.S. elections is relatively easy, right? Because you don't have to hack. The European elections are much harder because you, you, would, you would have to hack 20 million different um, votes. Here, we just have to go to the swing states and then play a little bit with it, which is really easy on Facebook, social media. You can, you can play around as much as you want. It's very difficult to control. I wonder, is the U.S. even able to play at the same level? We know that Israel, to an extent, is, and they've been playing that in, in, in the Middle East. But on this global level, the superpower that probably of, of cyber war that you know China has that too because they build it internally to protect their own citizens, so to speak, to keep them out um, to not have information coming in, keep that information out. But the U.S. never built these capabilities, from what I know publicly, and I know you maybe you are not able to to talk about classified information. But do we even have a capability that would rival what we see in Russia? Right. So. I I don't have the scientific data in front of me, nor is anyone going to put it in front of me. But based on my long experience and relationship inside the defense intelligence world, my my personal estimate is we have the most powerful capability in cyber warfare of any nation on the face of the earth. Now, as I said, we're restrained on when you use it and how to use it. The capability is, is, is there. But let me pull that aside for one second. You know, you talked about the Russians and the Chinese. And why are the Russians so uh, so much of a concern is they've been in spying in the United States for many, many decades, since uh, 1917, right? They've been in, in uh, with spy groups in the United States. But when you get into cyber, what a lot of people understand, sometimes the key to it is a human source that puts you inside of a network. So they've been doing the spying. Okay, now there's a national intelligence report that just came out and said the Russians were meddling in a slightly different way in in, in 2020. The Russians, look, uh, the Chinese looked at meddling and they decided it was too risky, right? So I come back to my thesis. The Russians don't think it's too risky. It's the, Chinese, uh, the Chinese do because they have an economic relationship. And the other thing is the Chinese have really only recently gotten into the human game in the United States. They were not really, if you looked at the, you know, going back into the 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, the Chinese cases were not really pre uh, prevalent. They lived in a tightly closed culture. So the Russians have been at this a long time. Yeah. So they're very, uh, very deep in. But the one point that I keep coming back to is, our elections are hard to influence in the same way that Europe, in a similar way, not that Europe, as I agree with you, is harder. But, you know, if you're not really trying to have an outcome, you don't have to have a strategic polling plan. You just want to cause that trouble. trouble. Yeah. In other words, you're, you're, the objective, I think we don't understand the objective. We get around personalities instead of the real objective is to get Americans feeling uncomfortable with their own political process getting them fighting with each other, not being able to get congressional. Because in other words, I'm not saying Putin has been successful to this degree. He didn't realize what was going to happen 
In other words, how we were going to respond. That with a little adventure in cyber, we have been uh, we have been politically weakened, but we're a resilient country, and I think we will come back from it. But I, again, I keep coming back. I think we're missing, and that's why I'm writing the book, the big picture. What is really happening, and we need to pay more attention to it. And yet, like many things, there's this big rush to China, and I get it. I'm, I understand it, and I would support the initiatives. But it's it's at the expense of an immediate an immediate threat as opposed to one that seems to be uh, laying out there not far over the horizon. But isn't that and that's you, you correct me if that's that's outdated? But it's like Russia isn't this geopolitical foe anymore. It's certainly not a we, we don't think of it as a superpower anymore. It still has nuclear weapons, no doubt, and it still has some of the smartest people on the planet, and it has definitely intention to hurt America, but. We think of it as, as you said earlier, as, um, I don't know, probably less of a problem than Iran, definitely less of a problem than China, because China's on the S, and we know that Russia stabilized to some extent, and they have capabilities. But what are they going to do with it besides causing trouble? They're not going to take over, maybe they take over the Ukraine, but as you said earlier, Afghanistan is under security threat to, to the U.S. If they take over the Ukraine, that's terrible for the Ukraine, but for us, it's probably not a big deal. Well, be careful if you have Ukrainian friends. That might, that might not go over <laughs> no, very well. I'm saying it's terrible but, for the Ukraine. But let me um, um, let me just take a second to talk about Putin, right? I have a chapter, the spy master uh, president, right? And he has a quote underneath. I have a quote underneath saying, there's no such thing as a former KGB guy, uh, Vladimir Putin, right? I know what he's talking about. I would say the same. There's no such thing as a former CIA guy, Jack Devine. It's a way of looking at the world. But you probe deeper into Putin, and you realize he wasn't a KGB. He was head of the FSB, which is uh, similar to our FBI, much bigger in, in scope. And when you you look at his career, he was a KGB officer. Hard to get into that service. It was an elite. He was sent to Dresden, you know, in that dark, uh, dark world of uh, Marcus Wolf, uh, the Carla of La Carre, La Carre, you know, and I, I, up, like, I, I literally grew up two miles from, from, from the embassy, the Russian embassy in Dresden. <laughs> so, so, you know, this was not, this is not known as a plush assignment. Paris, no, London, definitely not. Definitely definitely not. not right? So, but that's it's, where he it's was. It's a comfortable place. It's a very beautiful city, but it's yeah. it's not exciting by any means. It's, well, back then it was exciting in an intelligence point of view. But I mean, what yeah. I'm saying is, it was in that location that the Soviet Union collapsed. Soviet Union collapsed, and Putin was there. And what I'm saying, his formation is one of Russia is deserves to be a key player at the, uh, the international scene, and. Uh, therefore, I mean, we can talk about other aspects of Putin, but his main objective was to bring respect and dignity and a bigger role for Russia. His strategy is a Cold War strategy, and I don't think it's suitable for today, but it is weak in your neighboring countries. Sure. Russia without Ukraine is a much weaker country. And we need to understand that sitting here in Washington, D.C., New York, California. Ukraine really matters, as you said. So what has he done? He's taken over the Crimea, the eastern part, and then he's trying to, you know, whittle away at the West. So he's trying to recreate this world. And that world also had the United States as an adversary. So while he had, there isn't any communism, thank God, uh, in, as far as Russia is concerned, it's a nation state. But it is the same plan so when we say oh look at they're not they're, they don't have the economic political uh, might but they have enough might enough power and they'll exercise it the Chinese aren't going into Taiwan uh, the Russians went into Ukraine so I think there's a um, and I put yet in there but I mean I would say the, the the interplay here is they're punching well above above their weight and uh, we're they're forcing us to We've been slow to realize it because of the understandable distraction and need to go after terrorism, which reduced the amount of time and effort on Russia. You know, we're slowly coming back to beginning to appreciate it. And I think we were headed there, but now we have amped up, and, and I'm not saying we shouldn't amp up uh, China, but we should be able to, as the old Terry Ford said or something, you should be able to chew gum and walk, right? We should be able to handle two uh, two major targets. We always did throughout our history, and we should be able to do that. 
So I'm afraid that's a popular sentiment that why worry about Russia? Well, I mean, it's, it's somebody that may not, you know, they're, they're pushing, they're pushing their account pretty effectively. Foot, footprint in Iran, footprint in Syria, right? Meddling in, in Venezuela. How is this different than the Cold War? It's, you know, and now yeah. you're using cyber, cyber, like we had these covert action political things. And now, you know, we're sitting back and doing cyber warfare. And he's using it. And we've been more timid, not timid, let me, restrained. But I think, I think the timeline is wearing out. I, I think somewhere before long, if Russia doesn't come to some understanding, we're going to have to use it in a similar way. And, and I, I, I regret that because we don't really need a Cold War. Russia should be part of the West. It should be part of the European, European community. <laughs> yeah, that's we should, no, not going to happen. Yeah, but why, why, why was it? There's nothing intrinsically about Russia that would stop it from happening. You have a leadership that is an interest. I don't know if you, you can, can make this happen. So, so I lived a little bit in Russia. And my I, parents, don't think you can, you know, I don't think you make anything happen. Uh, I, I yeah. want to be clear. I said earlier, you can't force feed. But it doesn't necessarily, even though we can't change or shouldn't meddle in Russia's affairs, doesn't mean it can't change and should change. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's, there's a couple of really interesting points. One is that I always wonder about is, well, we created all the social media companies, mostly they're mostly US companies, California companies. It cannot be that hard to rein them in. So that's, I'm, I'm really mesmerized by this on one side. And then the other thing about geopolitics is, it, uh, there's a professor who made these predictions. Unfortunately, I can't fi figure out his name anymore. I read a book um, of his a couple of, I think 15 years ago, 10 years ago. And his geopolitical prediction at the time was um, what will happen, and he put a time stamp to it, it's 2028, is really, um, we see China, we see Iran, we see Turkey, we see Russia banding together and fighting against mostly that part of Western Europe and Eastern Europe that's still willing to fight. Germany won't, right? But say Poland will, and against the US. That's kind of his new Cold War that he predicted, I don't know, when he wrote the book in the early 2000s. And he made it very specific. He said, well, there will be mostly robots fighting other robots and it will be in Poland and it will, this, this is the main battlefield. And it, a lot of things are seemingly coming true when it is obviously a fictional picture. It seems like there's something to it. We definitely see Russia coming up and we see China coming up with more. They, they, they are allowed to do more because we are retreating from that world. And we know that Iran is up to something. And Turkey, we never know if they're a friend or foe, right? And nobody can tell. Maybe even the Turks don't know. So remember, Stalin was an ally of the United States. Yep. All right. And there was a communist country, a very repressive country. But Hitler came along and out of necessity, we, we made an alliance with them. And it only lasts one day in, went after the war, right? And then we started the Cold War. So not we started, the Cold War started. So, and when we look at these alliances, I mean, the question is, are they ephemeral? I mean, you know, do you have a oligarchy driven uh, Russia and a communist driven Chinese that both look at each other as real potential threats because they share such a common border and an unpleasant history in many ways. You know, Iran is a theocracy, right, that really doesn't have anything to do, any common grounds with either of those two countries. Yeah. And does China, what is its common bounds around the world? So it's an alliance. It's, you know, when you don't have anyone else to join forces, you know, you sometimes end up with what they call strange bedfellows. There was a, a famous spy, and I go into this, uh, that worked for the CIA. He was the number two person in the KGB in New York City. And he, uh, uh, in, in around 2000, give or take, uh, he volunteered his services and worked for a few years and then then retired <laughs> from the KGB uh, and came out in the public. And he, he's referred to as Comrade J. That was his title. And he said, well, one of the things really interesting when he joined the, uh, uh, the KGB uh, as a young man, the number one target was, number, was the United States, number two was NATO, and uh, uh, number three was China. And when I left in 2004, number one was the United States, number two was uh, NATO, and number three was China. <laughs> so yeah. uh, what I'm saying is it, it, 
I'm not demeaning in any way this theory and they, they are where convenient working together. But there's a long, uh, it's not an easy marriage, the three of those. Yeah, French, sure. French, Italian, sure. French, Italian, Spaniards, Germans, I recognize it. There's a history. But by and large, today there's a commonality of, of general interest about what is, you know, how are we going to live in Latin America? So, I mean, in other words, there's a commonality about in the rest of the world. I think it plays to our favor yeah. when people talk about China controlling the world. And they've got to convince people to live like the Chinese live, sacrifice like the Chinese. And you better be, uh, you better be able to speak. And, and uh, uh, in other words, you're going to have to be Chinese. You're not going to be able to stay and be a Kenyan or Bolivian or whatever. So uh, these things sound good until you start to scratch at them. And I, I don't think, uh, you know, I think we have to look at them as a short term, short term problem. We should be doing what we can to make those alliances less effective, we should be worried about our own alliance. Are we really strong with all the folks in the Western world and making sure we're tight with them? And, and then I think we could easily counter some combination of Iran, Russia, and China. Easy isn't the right word. Uh, let me just say one thing about the Cold War. I always thought we had such a huge advantage because the Russians were operating in a hostile world. Almost every country, even neutral countries, worked with the CIA intelligence. They may have been politically neutral, give or take, but the CIA had a force multiplier around the world. The Russians always had a hard time getting, getting allies. This is something that isn't factored in when people look at the strengths of, of, of countries. And, and also on the American side, you've got to make sure you're watering your plants, is the ability for the Russians to win over friends and, and, and influence people or the Chinese is uh, you have to have a product and it can't be just money or terror, I mean, or fear. So I, I think they've got a, a, a hard job to control, to, to, to replace the United States as a leader. Particularly oh, I, if you have, I, I Europe, if you have a Europe and US, Latin American, large parts of Africa and Asia. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty strong, loose alliance, if you will. I uh, No, I agree with you. And it's when you, I think what, what, and you, you just spoke to that point, what way too few people put um, their minds to is the flow of immigrants. It's when people could go wherever they wanted, where would they go? Well, they would go to Western Europe and to the US, right? And so that's that's telling you something about a certain minority, maybe the majority of people all around the globe that would rather come here. If China would open up their borders, anyone could settle there? Well, I don't think millions and billions of people would, would move. <laughs> Thank you, right? Russia is the same way. It's a tough place to be economically. Uh, and so, that's a really that's a really good point that I haven't heard anyone make, but I couldn't agree. I, I, I couldn't agree, agree more that uh, there's not going to be a lot of flow. The other thing is you're not going to be terribly welcome. The United States, of because of its history, there was nobody here other than Native Americans. It was a very small population. This country was about the frontier and building out from the east coast all the way across the west and it was people coming here of every nationality around the world um coming with barely a shirt in their back and and, and making this country country work so it was a welcoming place and then uh you know there's been different periods where you you have to slow down the process because everybody wants to come right so then you, you say we can't absorb everybody so we'll absorb those that are going to provide capabilities but it's it should be i don't know country, really, country blind you, you bring the capabilities come on in but Jack, think about this it, the, matthew iglesias made that proposal and I, I i love it every day a little more why don't we bring in a billion new immigrants well what is the problem obviously we would have to change when we can't hand on social security okay done but if you have a billion americans who are all super productive and who pay taxes or more than that it, what we create in this world, but what we, we, we stand out there and say, well, we have, we have figured out the democracy, we have figured out the institution, we figured out how to be friendly, we, we figured out all these questions, now learn from America. And people do. And then if they want to come here because they can't live like this, because that country doesn't allow them, we don't let them in. I think this is terrible. No, you can't absorb a billion people. I mean, you well, can't have a, <laughs> well, you open your border. <laughs> well, there's one. There's not a billion jobs. I mean, we can only add jobs at a certain pace, right? I mean, well, well, so when you're going to have a billion, sure. a billion people out of work for, for what? But 
what is important in your point? I mean, we, we could debate that, but I, I don't think we should spend too much time on it. We have an immigration flow, whether it's legal or illegal. The United States is healthy in getting new blood. Uh, yeah. But if you look at, you know, uh, China, much of the world has real population problems. In other words, population and production are, are tied. You need to have a growing population and in order for economy. I'm not an economist to be uh, functioning. So we have, you know, substantial immigration. I mean, you're talking hundreds of thousands of people coming every year, just walking across the border yeah. and they're absorbed into the system. But look at the birth rates. Russia's birth rate, China's birth rate. I've just read today the lowest since like Mao Zedong or something like that. So, you know, in order to be long term, the graying of countries around the world, America's immigration keeps it young. But mathematically, you know, you have to feed a billion people for whatever amount of time, clothe them, put them up. It's not doable, right? We only have 330 million. So it'd be three more. I'd have three more of Mousafil, and I'm already got 15 grandkids. So, you know, we can't, we can't. Yeah. I know, what it, I, know what it takes, I know what it takes to go from one child to four, okay? So, <laughs> so we're talking yeah. about 300 to a billion. But I think the concept, um, we are, I mean, immigration is good for America. The more you can organize it, uh, the better. Yeah. When, when you look at the United States, um, how it's been developing the last 20 years, I feel like having, not having a good enemy has made us quite lazy. And we've, we've, not developed, not just our image, but the way we approach other countries, not with the same kind of sharpness we had before. And we we kind of, I don't know if we, we let the alliance slip because we felt like we don't, we didn't need them anymore and there's no threat anyways, or if it's something else, something more cultural. Do you think there is an easy way to rebuild and strengthen these alliances or are they in good shape? We don't have to do anything. Well, let me do, you have two big questions. One is, is there a softening of America or will or resolve, right? Yeah. And again, this was a fabulously, is a fabulously rich country, you know, and, and I want to come back to its formation. There was a theory written, and I haven't seen anyone address it in a long time, it was Frederick Turner, said America's greatness came from its ever-expanding frontier, right? The ingenuity, the entrepreneurial, the energy, the sacrifice that made this country, right? And we ran out of space in the sense of a, a territorial expansion by 1960. So when Jack Kennedy gave his inaugural address in 1960, it was titled The New Frontier, and it's off of that concept. So he was thinking about our space, right? But when 1960 came, so that challenge sort of uh, came out of it, and the Cold War was real. Everybody felt it, and we were united. So when the the wall came down. There was uh, many people had written Pax Americana, the uh, the uh, the future of democracy. In other words, there wasn't going to be democracy will flow. But instead of that, what we really found is uh, a tendency to be more insular, breaking down into special interests. There wasn't so we're losing some of the great consensus that. Uh, enabled this country to be so effective. In the Cold War, you couldn't tell, when I would go down on uh, the cyclone operation, the Afghan operation, as you referred to, uh, it's hard to tell, honestly, who was a Democrat and who was a Republican. Charlie Wilson was a Democrat, right? And he was pushing as hard as any Republican in terms of making sure that the fight against communism and the Russians was, was vigorous. We don't have that today. And I think there is an examination Country, the country pulls together in a crisis. And the, one of the things that surprised me about the COVID-19, and maybe it's because of the uniqueness of it, you know, 9-11 brought the country together. Six months, not much longer, but for six months, this country was united the way it was united in World War II and so on. But COVID didn't unite us. I mean, and maybe it's just the nature of it, but it's usually great crises where countries find their soul again. But you don't pray for crisis. Why? Because you have family and children. You want to go through the crisis. So we have been blessed when you look at the troubles of countries around. Now, look at Europe. You're one you know familiar. I mean, the, the marching of armies across Europe. I mean, you know, the Russians were talking earlier. They lost 11 million people. Stalin. I mean, America has not, other than the Civil War, you know, the, the, this country has been spared those, those, those tragedies. And I'm not rooting from it. But somewhere inside, we have to find that that 
that common core of what really matters. And this is why we're vulnerable to cyber attack in the political arena. In other words, if we had the consensus, it'd be tougher to break, it'd be tougher to cause trouble if we were united. But if you're able to go into the system and stir up different interest groups against each other, that's a vulnerability. So I, I, I think that's something worth pondering, the, how vulnerable we are on this. The alliances are ter terribly important. And, uh, you know, I lived in Europe, I lived in Latin America, I mean, serving our, our country. And, you know, uh, there was a period, frankly, when I was in, uh, in a European country. <laughs> Let me say I visited UK. But when I was there, there was a tremendous split in, in, within the government of whether they wanted to be continental or, or the special relationship with America. It was starting to fray. And with the election of Blair, I'm not tying it to him, the alliance, they decided we're going with the American and it became more of a special relationship. But, you know, I think the roots are so deep with France and Italy, Germany, you know, today, uh, Poland, many of these countries. I, I mean, I think these are lasting relationships and there's no alternative. You either go it alone. I mean, is any good thinking German or Italian going to say, let bring on that system that the Russians have. Let's run Germany and Italy like we run Russia. Let's bring that Chinese Communist Party in the well, I mean, it's a dying, it's a dead ideology, but the Chinese are holding on to it and sincerely holding on. That's the scary part. So I think the alliances are strong. Um, and, you know, I, I think we continue to work to make them stronger. But uh, why I think the Chinese, Russian, and Iranian relationships are not long lasting, I think the natural relationship between Europe and the United States runs deep. Remember, most Americans have their roots in either Latin America or Europe. Yeah. I mean, they're recent times from Asia and elsewhere, but during World War II, it was tough on Italians. I mean, because they, you know, they, they had loyalties to America and their country, and they fought vigorously to defend their, to their, their country and try and beat the, uh, the Nazis out of, out of Italy. So I, I think we're okay. I just, I don't want to take, I don't think we should take Europe for granted, nor should we uh, be taken for granted. Yeah. I do feel that the resolve in Europe is a real problem. Some countries are better than others, but I think the resolve to actually stand for the values they are supposed to represent, that's a real problem. And it's, it's more problem, say, in, in core Germany and core France. Uh, I don't know if a crisis will, will, we would help, it, we would help see it again. Um, that would that would change that, but I think there is a, there's certain countries in Europe where I feel the resolve is strong, and others where I don't see they have any resolve. I mean, you can literally roll through it. As say Russian troops, nothing. They would they would be welcome, so to speak. I find that really odd. That's that's surprising. Yeah, I, I think that. I think the West has has had. Uh, you don't say too much of a good thing, but in a way, we've had peace in our countries in Europe. I mean, rampaged by war by centuries, right? I mean, really. Yeah deadly wars from you know, they used right. to have revolutions every 60 years in pretty much every european country everything yeah. would change everything would start over the currency is gone all the jobs are gone and then they would start from scratch that was normal like for look, 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 years what's their strength look, look, look at look at look at the uk i mean the hundred years war i mean it was only only in relatively modern times so italy was 48 countries if i remember i mean yeah. principalities so the world has changed, and it changed favorably after the catharsis, uh, catharsis uh, war, World War II. So, uh, but we've had a, a good living. People don't feel threatened. Uh, and I think the best thing that I can recommend is, you know, in our schools, we need to spend more time on history. And yeah. without modern politics, I mean, just what is what makes you know what was what's the history of the world? Because we take it for granted that you know you can live a good life and no one's going to bother you, right? Yeah. But I've been in countries where you know you said something bad about the president, you'd be in jail, or worse, you disappear. We we tend to take in Western Europe the same that nothing bad can happen. But yet, if you read Western history. A lot of bad things happen, really vicious things. We have the capacity to kill each other. So we need, we need, that's why laws and legal systems, democracy, as inefficient as Congress and Parliament may be at times, they're a blessing. Yeah.
When when we go to places that are not as happy right now, and we see this in Syria, right? So we have Russia on one side, we have the U.S. on one side, we have Turkey, we have Iran. This all everyone is involved. It's a good old, good Cold War conflict. Lots of proxies involved. What do you think should we have done with, with Syria? And I talked to Joshua yesterday. He was very critical of sanctions, especially now that it seems to die down a little bit. It, it, it prevents the country from rebuilding. But should we? Should we have not? Should we just have relied on covert operations, just let it go, so to speak, um, get it in the hands of Iran and Russia, and then deal with the aftermath? What do you think are, is is our foreign policy recipe? Should we be way more careful with these interventions, which seemingly always end up in a mess, and we, we we start small, and then they always explode, and we bring troops, and then stay forever, and then twenty years later we feel like, well, nothing really has changed once we leave. Uh, what do you think should be our policy? When when do we switch from one policy instrument to the next one? What's like kind of our threshold? Right, and this is why your audience desperately needs to read my two books <laughs> because <laughs> because I go into it in the, in excruciating detail. Uh, but I have a I have a point of view, and that's why I've I've written the, the the books. And that is there is a role for covert action. In other words, you have military operations, kinetic, usually very expensive, very costly in human lives and years to rectify after you have a war. I mean, they're just, you want to avoid it at all means. Diplomacy, negotiations, constantly, it's an art form, brinkmanship, definitely needed. But I've always felt that there are, are interests, of, of, I'll just speak from an American point of view, interest around the world when we were representing the free world and the Russians were representing, lesser degree, the Chinese, the communist world back then, uh, we were uh, we were representing uh, representing uh, a, a, a world uh, a world view, and as a result of it, uh, the question was: How do you project your your vision? Your yeah. there was a feeling that every American feel oh democracy should be everywhere. So we had that warm fuzzy feeling we should do that. Yeah. And and protect interest. And when you're challenged by military and covert things, how do you respond? So my view is before you get into military conflict, you have to exhaust all your diplomatic. But before you get in, you look at, is there another way to do this without putting American forces, visible U.S. military units and regiments and battalions on the ground? And then you examine covert action. And I have in the book the very principles of it, and I'd probably be too much to lay it all out. But basically, one of the key things is you have to real national security interest. The people on the ground have to want what you want. If they don't, you're wasting time, money, and, and, and life. So there are certain conditions. You can't force feed a, a certain path. And we have to yeah. keep learning this lesson over and over again. The reason Afghanistan was so good, as I said earlier, in terms of covert action, is they shared a common view. They wanted to get rid of the Russians. They wanted to fight. So, and this was from our point of view, of national interest. When we decided to put troops in Afghanistan or we decided to go into Iraq, you know, these are big, long term decisions. We're still in both places, uh, three to six trillion dollars, no matter how you cut it, substantial amount of lives. When we walk, when when both are said and done, we're probably going to be back to where we were before we went in. And the fundamental reason, I, I think, in the end, was we were trying to bring something there that wasn't uh, the people didn't want, weren't ready, and we 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 had we were more ambitious than the realities on the ground. We had to go in and get Bin Laden going in and bringing down the Taliban, getting Bin Laden, and then leaving people to, to move on. In the Middle East, it's a very sticky wicket, right? And you have the Sunni Shia, you have so many different things. You have to pick and choose where you go. And I would recommend we do it with military assistance and diplomatic economic aid and where appropriate. And again, covert action is not to be used in democratic countries, right? I, I'm, I'm, I want to be clear. It really should be used against adversarial countries or countries that are uh, working contrary to our interests. But I, I can't think of a covert action operation in modern times against uh, uh, a, a, a democratic government. Right after the World War II, there were some, but that was defending Western Europe, Italy, but that that really ended by the 50, early 50s. So 
uh, is a long way of saying, uh, even though CIA gets a, a lot of publicity, negative publicity about covert action, we need to think about using that tool. And we need to think about in cyber, what are the ground rules and how? And I go into this in the book, and I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but you know, you don't want a kinetic interchange. You do not want to firefight when you can you can handle it uh, covertly and working through you know surrogates. And that sounds demeaning unless you think about what a surrogate is. And that is somebody that really wants you know you can't hire fighters. You know, you hire them, and then when the firefight starts, they're gone. In other words, you, you can have surrogates, but they're surrogates because they have a mission and are prepared, a mission and then they're prepared to go forward. So I'm an advocate of using our muscle abroad in a very controlled and limited way, which is covert action. I think the covert action costs, let's roughly speaking, probably around a billion dollars a year in the last couple of years of it. And you think of the amount of money that's been spent in trying to build an army in Afghanistan and so on, and you match it up with what will likely be the outcome, uh, you know, I, I think I could be a good salesman for using another path. Yeah, I think we're all tired of these wars, right? It's just, it's it's a PR nightmare sooner or later. It's it's a huge problem to to actually lives lost. And uh, there is this, this crazy expenditure that goes with it, just securing the troops who are there, right? So that's, I think, 90% of the effort many times. Is that's, why I don't, that's, that's why you don't need a, stand, a standing army is the last last recourse and a firefight is the last recourse Colin Powell after the uh, desert storm and, and uh, the Bush administration's effort to support the Kuwaitis and then push back on Iraq was he was opposed to taking Baghdad right why you know once you t once you take over a country you own it if you broke it it's yours like in a store you break it you own it and ownership requires huge amounts of time, money, and human resources, which are drained from the body politic. In other words, it's, it, it, it's energy, money, lives that could be used and deployed elsewhere. What would we do with $4 trillion today? I know what we would do. We'd have a stimulus bill, but instead we're going to borrow the money instead of having it in the bank. I mean, that's rather crass analysis, and a good economist would say that not yeah. it. But my point is still the same. It's hard to forecast, too. Uh, when you think of the, the Second World War, yes, it was a very costly war on all sides. But the, the occupation of Germany wasn't hard, wasn't hard after 19, 1945, right? It was maybe hard for the Russians, but not hard for Brits, French, and for Americans, right? It self-organized itself within a couple of years. And that well, was the French, yeah. the French, the Italians, the, 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 uh, the Brits, and eventually the United States, we didn't have a choice. In other words, once you're attacked... You know, well, right. you're attacked, in other words, when you have people a people had in mind in, in 2000, right? They said, oh, it's going to be like Germany. We're just going to spend like a few years and then it's self-organized. It's going to be another Kuwait or another United Arab Emirates. Yeah, but, but my point would be you don't start until you've been attacked. In other words, there has to be a real national security. And then you must respond. And I'm yeah. saying in the cyber area, we're there and people aren't picking up on the fact that this is, there's got to be, a resp there has to be a response. So, uh, in those, when you put arms on the ground, when you've been attacked, that's what armies are built for. Yeah. When you bring them in to democratize a country or push back some internal feud, and if there isn't a clear national security interest in the United States, in Afghanistan, it really wasn't the Taliban. We weren't really worried about the Taliban for years. It was bin Laden was there and was protected by them. So the objective yeah. was, you've been attacked by him, you go in, get him. But how we jump from that and say, well, let's put a big army in uh, that. I think, let me come back. These are well-intentioned things. I mean, Iraq was, well, the people were well-intentioned. But that doesn't mean it's excusable as, uh, as, uh, as uh, bad policy. In other words, just because you're well-intentioned. You know, and a job, if you're, I think everyone you make a mistake in a job, you're fired, right? Yeah, no matter what yeah. your intention. So the same thing is true here. I don't think it was... Let's take over a rock and get the oil. I mean, we somehow drift into, and this is the problem, and I keep coming back to the book. We drift into things. Vietnam, we drifted in. You exactly. know, we should have stayed supporting the, uh, the South Vietnamese when they were not willing to, in large enough numbers, 
resist, fight, then you have to reduce your, your support and pull back. You don't but put an arm normal? But isn't that normal? So say you do a, a, a covert operation, you have to go with that. Say we go to Syria, with COVID, we went with covert operations. Sooner or later, someone will take and will take in hostage, right? Or will be shot. I mean, we want to get the body out. So we send more people and then maybe we have more losses of life. And then we say, oh, well, we have, we, we, it feels like an attack. So we have to send in the Air Force. The Air Force comes in and then we, we, a couple of them get shot down. You're like, oh, this, this shouldn't be the case. And then it's so easy from, like, literally you have one asset on the ground. Even if it's just a drone, it's so, because you get the same PR nightmare in Pakistan and Afghanistan, it's almost impossible to control because you, the facts kind of, they make their own facts, right? The people at home, they perceive it quite differently than the original strategy because you're not allowed to talk about it because it's classified. Well, that quote on the Bible, uh, as you walk through the door, it says, you know, tell us the truth, the facts. It doesn't say, give us your best wishful thinking about how you would like the world, and let's build intelligence and covert action around it. Well, so, no when, so when you look at a particular incident and it's come before you, you must react. Yeah. And proportionality is uh, really hard to arrive at, but that's one of the ingredients and, and the arguments for a just war, which is proportionality. But you have to respond. You don't respond, you're going to get hit again. And this is why the cyber war again has to be, uh, be, be dealt with. So, you know, when you're attacked, you can't sit there and fold your arm. If someone's kidnapped, the degree that you can, you go in. That doesn't necessarily mean you put an army in. But again, so, that sinking feeling, we only know afterwards is it was a just war or not. But because well, it seemed, well, we go no, through it. No, we I, I, no, no, no. Really? Uh, I, I'm going to send you an extra copy of my books. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I look, the first thing let's let's know. say we're on it it's actually i steal half of it from the theologians of the 1300s right which is an argument for a just war yeah. what is what's an argument for just war intrinsically evil today in modern language a real national security issue in other words it has to be and honest people around the table might disagree but i'm coming back to don't wish no, let's not wish let's be really hard-nosed is it a national security risk Two, have you exhausted all other possibilities? Did we exhaust all possibilities before we went in after Saddam Hussein? That's a question I'm leaving for you. Uh, is there a realistic chance of success? That is a requirement uh, you know, from, from the early writers of a just war. In other words, if you don't think you can prevail, then you're not, you are morally obligated, for those that are morally oriented, not to get in, uh, involved in it. Proportionality. Do not send an army in to save one person, right? You send a, a small unit in. Uh, collateral damage. You have to make sure that innocent civilians, you have to reduce it, right? Uh, so then Jack Devine, not to compare myself to the great theologian 13th century, I'm saying, you need bipartisan support in the United States. You have bipartisan support. This is going to turn out bad over the, over the long run. Don't dabble. Don't do a little covert action. If you don't really think this is a big deal and you're not going to, don't dabble in it. And sometimes Congress says, we'll throw a little money. We can say we're doing something, right? You got to put the money in and you have to have the people on the ground both to carry it out, that want to do it. And you have to have the talent and skill in the agency or the special forces or whatever unit you're drawing on. So these are, you know, you can sit around a table and you might disagree on each of these points, but I think reasonable people will generally find a strong consensus. And if you don't have a consensus, if you have one person opposing it, he might be right, but you know, uh, you're, you're still, you're in a comfort zone. If people are split five, five, you probably need to keep studying the problem. Yeah. Do you think it, there is something, when you apply all these filters, right, there are filters to not go into to full scale wars. And I think they're, they're, they're ex excellent filters, of course, but you gotta have the strength and the vision and also the, the, the electorate to let these things play out, right? So say the, the decision is, well, we don't really know what we're doing, so we're not going in. And then we, we hear this barrage of news two years later, people will get really disappointed of you if the populist thinks, oh, you did, you did the wrong call, you made the wrong call. That's, I think it's not easy to sit these things up because that's, I think, what we're required. Each filter oh. that we add, we, we sit more things up. This is the beauty of democracy. Okay, we can't. I mean, you can have an autocrat make you easy and fast decisions and make you stick to it, right? Yeah. Until the, until their heads chopped off, right? But in the democratic process, and this is where there's an obligation, and I actually believe it works in the main. And that is, as I said earlier, no covert action, and I would say no military action, can take place without the president of the United 
uh, President of the United States signing it, and Congress approving it and funding it. Why is that so important? It's the, the Congress is a check and balance because they have to go back to the people two years later, four years later. So they have to do a litmus test. And what's that litmus test is, is this going to sell back in my, my bureau? So when we got to Afghanistan, people looked at it and said, hey, this is a winner. This is not, I'm not going to have a problem. I'll support it. That's a good thing. And if they looked at Central America, nah, this doesn't feel like a winner, then they oppose it. So the democratic process is your best check. And I know a lot of people like efficiency. Right? You say, well, look, let's get this done. Let's make it really secret. We'll just tell the president and two people in Congress, right? Yeah. Let's not tell State Department, DOJ, or Defense Department. Next thing you know, you're going down a road and you didn't get the benefit of all this other, and you're not forced to get the will of the American people. You cannot construct covert action without a, a temperature check. It's imperfect. Yeah. But if you make a bad decision on Iraq, let's say if you decide that, or bad decision, you then are very vulnerably thrown out. And yeah. whatever one may think of the American electorate, and why we have moments, and I know we can talk about different things, they have a pretty good sense of their own self-interest. And we may be a divided country about it, what it is, but within their self-interest, they're pretty focused on what they, what they want to have happen. And the problem is you shouldn't do any adventuring unless you have a broad majority. And now we're split to, you know, it'd be nice if we had a, a wholesome uh bipartisanship around a set of international issues. I mean, we can't have everything. We're too far apart. And uh, I think all leaders, all the political leaders and uh, at all levels need to work hard to find it because I don't know if they really understand how debilitating it is in the foreign policy arena not to have a consensus about where we're going. I think this is a perfect place because I'm losing my voice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we I, went an hour 20. What an hour 20. I can go in a, I can go three hours, but I'm not I don't want to be Fidel Castro today. It's a tough call. It's a tough call. No, I mean I really I your time's very valuable. I, I this was amazing insight. I only had very few questions left. Maybe we'll do this next time. How's that? Okay. I think that's a deal. That's a deal. Sounds good. Sounds Have good. me back. I mean there's a lot you talked about before. There's a, many things, but the reason I joined you is it's not a talking head, five second, you know, shouting blurb, right? It's taking a look historically, teasing it out. And I, and I really enjoyed the thoughtfulness of your question, an opportunity to let me tease it out rather than just, yes, it's a bad idea, a good idea. Or, and name, we didn't name, we didn't name call anybody. <laughs> to the <laughs> yeah, best I of my knowledge. I don't remember that. Yeah, I don't right? remember because that. Because I, I don't want to add to the division among us. I want to, you know, let's talk substance. President and let's Trump leave, didn't, let's didn't leave. hijack our brains for this conversation. <laughs> so, <laughs> former President Trump. Um, well, thanks again. I really appreciate that. And I hope you get to do the same thing next time. Well, I so. look forward to it. Thank you very much. Bye. Awesome. Take it easy. Bye-bye.